And I just sat there and just thought about what he must have endured. I never would imagine that Shane would let this happen. I told them that I was like deathly terrified to go back with them. It broke my heart to know that he died that way. I don't know how anyone could do that to anyone. Today, we have yet another case that highlights the many failures in our child welfare system. A child who never had a chance from the very beginning. He was first failed by his parents, the first line of defense for a child. After that, he was continuously failed by the system despite numerous adults in his life trying to help him, trying to do what was best for him. But no matter what anybody did to try and save poor Gavin's life, the red tape that is our government system prevented anyone from being able to actually help. And because of that, a 10-year-old boy suffered the worst kind of torture imaginable, and he is now dead. I want to use now as a warning that the details in today's case are horrendous. They are gut-wrenching and heartbreaking, and I know this is going to be a really tough one for a lot of you to hear, so if you are extra sensitive to these types of cases, this may not be the video for you. But with that being said, let's get into the case. This is the horrendous story of Gavin Peterson. Gavin Hansen Peterson was born January 15th, 2012 to Melanie Peterson and Shane Peterson in Ogden, Utah. And he had two siblings, a then 21 year old brother named Tyler and a 19 year old sister, Miloni. Gavin was known as such a happy boy with a contagious smile and laugh. Gavin was intelligent, funny, and curious. He loved science and enjoyed learning all about the solar system. He was your typical preteen boy who loved Pokemon and the Nintendo Switch, and his favorite color was blue. He was kind to everyone around him, and despite everything he went to in his short life, he absolutely loved his family. And let me say, hearing just how much he loved his family and wanted to spend time with them really makes this case that much more heartbreaking knowing what they did to him in return. I don't have too many details surrounding the relationship between Melanie and Shane, but I do know that they were once married for quite a long time, and both of Gavin's older siblings were born to Shane and Melanie. At some point, when Gavin was pretty young, the pair split up and Shane got remarried to Nicole Scott. It's known that Melanie had some issues with drug use, specifically with marijuana use, which some would say isn't that big of a deal, but it is illegal in Utah, so using it, especially around children, is going to get you in trouble. And me saying that is not making light of the situation I'm about to tell you about Melanie at all. According to court documents, back in August of 2014, a police officer found a then two-year-old Gavin walking around alone outside the home unsupervised. The officer picked him up and eventually located his home and spoke with Melanie. Inside the home, the officer found a full marijuana pipe sitting on a shelf out in the open in the front room. By November of 2014, she ended up pleading guilty to drug charges as well as charges of exposing a child to drugs. For this, Melanie was sentenced to 100 hours of community service and she owed a $600 fine. She was also ordered to complete a mental health evaluation and treatment, complete a parenting program, and complete substance abuse treatment. At this time, Melanie also lost custody of all three children pending completion of her sentence. By February of 2015, she completed all of her community service hours and paid her fine. She then officially completed her mental health and drug abuse treatment in July of 2015. She also had a job and was able to maintain her employment. She did everything she was told to do. Everything she did was to better herself for her own mental health and so that she could be the best mom she possibly could. She took the treatments and classes seriously, doing everything she could to get her children back. Despite this though, she actually never was able to get custody back. Years passed before Melanie was even able to see her children again. For those years, she had no idea of the conditions her children were being kept in. She didn't know that they were suffering under Shane and Nicole's care. I'm sure she hoped for the best, never thinking that a human being, the father of her children, could harm them. But that isn't what was actually happening. By 2018, Melanie apparently got a text from Shane offering for Gavin to live with her, but that never went through. Then by Memorial Day in 2019, Shane randomly dropped their second oldest, Miloni, off at Melanie's house and then drove away without saying a word. 
According to Melanie, when she saw Meloni for the first time, she appeared malnourished and her hair had been buzzed off. It was during that weekend when Melanie learned of the horrific conditions under which she and Gavin had been living. Meloni told her mom that for the first two years she lived with Shane and Nicole, things were pretty normal except for the fact that they totally manipulated her into hating her mom, constantly bad-mouthing her, making her seem like the worst person in the world. Because of that, she cut off all contact with her mom during that time. But after two years, when she was around 13 years old in 2018, she started noticing a shift in her father and stepmother's attitude towards her. As Meloni got older, she started looking more and more like Melanie and Nicole resented her for it. She started calling her names every day, constantly talking down to her and making her feel awful. Nicole started berating her and beating her over absolutely nothing. They trapped her in her room for hours on end, up to days at a time, with the lock being on the outside of the door so she couldn't get out. Sometimes they would even zip tie her to the bed, preventing her from even getting up. Then she said Nicole had installed security cameras in the bedrooms so she could keep tabs on Miloni every second of the day. If Nicole ever saw her move too much while she was tied up, Miloni said that Nicole or Shane would beat her over and over and over again. Most days, Nicole would beat her with a belt or a wooden spoon, sometimes even throwing things at her. Most of the time, the punishments were carried out by Nicole, but sometimes Shane would also participate, or at the very least, he would watch. So that just shows, again, he was very well aware of what was going on, and not only that, but he was fully complacent and allowing it to happen and even encouraging it to happen. Miloni had to ask permission to do absolutely everything, including showering, using the restroom, and brushing her hair. One time, Miloni found a comb on the floor and started brushing her hair with it because her hair hadn't been cared for in a long time. Well, Nicole caught her brushing her hair and was absolutely pissed that she dared to brush her hair without asking permission. As a punishment, Nicole shaved her head. In addition to that, Miloni said that Nicole and Shane treated her like a maid. She would be forced to spend long hours outside doing yard work at their home, as well as at their great-grandmother's house who lived across the street. There were days where she was put outside in the morning and forced to work all day without breaks until dinner time. Even with all of the physical labor she had to do though, she was only being given one to two meals per day. And it's not like they were full hearty meals at the end of the day either. She was given one or two slices of bread which were smothered in mustard because Nicole knew that Miloni hated mustard. By March of 2019, Miloni said that a friend noticed her condition and reported her concerns to the school counselor who then brought in a worker from DCFS to do an interview. In that interview, at first, Miloni told her that she was fine because she was afraid of what Shane and Nicole would do to her if she told them what was really going on. But eventually, she did open up about some things that she was experiencing in the home. She showed her some of the bruises she had and told her about some of the punishments she was receiving. At that time, a safety plan was created for Miloni. Apparently, it was decided that Nicole cannot be alone with Miloni. Instead, she would go to her great-grandmother's house across the street until Shane got home. Then, she was allowed to go home. After this was set in place a few weeks after the case was closed, DCFS said there was nothing more they could do. As you could imagine, knowing that DCFS got involved and knowing that Miloni told the worker about Nicole, Nicole just got angrier and angrier. By April, the abuse started to get worse, so she tried running away to her mother's house, but Nicole and Shane caught her at a gas station. They put her in the car, and according to Miloni, Nicole strangled her so badly that she thought she was going to die. After that, she wasn't allowed to go to school for the last two weeks of school, probably because of the bruising this attack left on Miloni. Nicole also told her that she just didn't deserve to go to school. During those weeks, she was left outside pretty much all day, every day. And as a side note, that is one thing that I want to talk about is that I feel like this is something that a lot of DCFS caseworkers just do not understand is that when you confront the parents about accusations that their child has made, if they are abusing them, 
these accusations and meeting up with them and having to go through all of this is just going to make the parent matter and matter at that child. It's most of the time going to cause the abuse to get worse knowing that the child is going out and ratting on them. So the fact that these safety plans are put in place where Nicole is still allowed to be in the home with her just because Shane is there, it makes absolutely no sense. And then again, the fact that the case was closed so quickly after and then it was just left, like nothing we could do about it, is just ridiculous because again, you are just leaving that child so much more vulnerable because now their abusive parent knows that they're telling people. And we see that very clearly in this case because I don't think Nicole was strangling Miloni before this. This is the first time we've heard of her going that far. Miloni Peterson says she lived in a world of isolation under the roof of her father, Shane Peterson, and stepmother, Nicole Scott. She called me names every day. The emotional and physical abuse started in late 2018 when she was about 13. Melani describes disturbing details like the time Nicole allegedly shaved her head as punishment for brushing her hair. At that time, I was mostly focused on surviving. But that was only the start. They would starve me until I was like, really skinny. Bread with mustard. Melani says Nicole included the mustard because the kids hated it. I can't go there. She also alleges being locked inside a bedroom. Nicole tracked her every move with the camera. At one point, zip tied her to the bed. They would uh, tie my ankles, and she said if I moved, she'd beat me over and over again. Milani says Nicole beat her with a belt or a wooden spoon. In March 2019, a concerned friend reported the abuse at school, and Milani alleges DCFS was brought in. They basically told me that they couldn't do anything. I told them that I was like deathly terrified to go back with them. Instead, Melani says a safety plan was created and Nicole wasn't allowed to be alone with her. I remember her telling me she wanted to kill me. But the abuse allegedly continued until May of 2019 when Melani was finally able to go live with her mom. But Gavin wasn't allowed to come with her. Either way, by Memorial Day in 2019, Miloni was mowing the lawn when she ran over a sprinkler and broke it. At the time, Nicole was sleeping and Shane was the one who caught her. She was absolutely terrified of what would happen as a result of this. But at the time, Shane told her to get in the car so they could go buy a replacement. However, instead of getting that replacement, Shane drove her over to Melanie's house and dropped her off. Without any word, without any explanation, he just dropped her off and that was that. And that is when Melanie saw how underweight Miloni was and was immediately concerned. Now, after being dropped off with Melanie and telling her of the abuse she endured all that time, of course, Melanie reported this to the police department, who then referred her to the Department of Child and Family Services. When she first tried to make the report, it was a holiday weekend, so the offices were closed. Eventually, she was able to make a report and DCFS workers did come to interview Miloni. But, as you could have guessed, nothing was done. One of the officers Melanie originally spoke to really downplayed the accusations. He basically told her that, you know, Shane might have been a bit too strict while Melanie was a little bit too lax in her parenting style. The officer said that he couldn't arrest someone over, quote, a bad haircut. Then, when interviewed by the DCFS worker, they basically told Miloni that there was nothing they could do without physical evidence. Even though she had a bruise from Nicole's beating, even though she was very clearly underweight, they said there was nothing they could do. No real investigation was done and the case was closed, leaving Gavin and Tyler in that home with the two abusers. By November of 2019, Melanie fought harder than she ever did before to see Gavin, especially now knowing what they were going through. By now, she was finally granted visitation rights and was allowed to see Gavin every other weekend. During these visits, she also noticed signs of malnourishment on Gavin. This time, Melanie decided to document her concerns so that there would be proof of this if the case was ever investigated. So by February of 2020, during one of these visits, she took a photo of Gavin shirtless, looking very clearly emaciated and underweight. However, Melanie taking that picture only caused Nicole to get pissed. 
According to Melanie, Nicole found out that she took this photo, and in response, she made a false complaint to DCFS, which ended her visitation rights while DCFS investigated the complaint. This investigation was super dragged out, though, because the timing of it just couldn't have been any worse. This was all happening right at the start of the COVID pandemic. Most things were starting to shut down around March and April of 2020, so this case just sat in limbo for years. Because of this, that February 2020 visit was the last time Melanie saw Gavin. Meanwhile, as Melanie was being blocked from seeing Gavin and Shane and Nicole were allowed to continue this alleged abuse, those at school were also starting to notice red flags from Gavin. During the 2021-2022 school year, teachers and staff were concerned with how small Gavin looked. He definitely looked small for his age. He was quite thin and his hair was buzzed. He was also missing school quite frequently. That, obviously, in and of itself, is not a huge problem. Some kids are just small. Some like having short hair and some get sick a lot. However, there were some behaviors that stood out to staff, especially one school cafeteria worker, Jan. Jan got to know Gavin pretty well during his time at school. She reported that Gavin would come up and grab a cup of water and then would casually take this cup of water and throw it in the trash where the other kids would dump their lunch trays. Then he would start digging through the garbage and eating the food out of the trash. He tried to hide what he was doing, but it was pretty obvious that he was so, so hungry. Seeing this absolutely broke Jan's heart, so she and another cafeteria worker started paying for his lunch. Once she started doing that, apparently the school discouraged her because they wanted to encourage the families going through rough times to fill out a form for reduced or free lunch. But that isn't what was going on. Obviously, not all parents whose children go without food are suffering from poverty. Some parents just don't care enough about them to pay for their lunch. Some parents specifically want to prevent their children from eating lunch, as we see in this case. After these staff members continued paying for Gavin's lunch, at some point, Nicole found out that there was money in his school account which was being used for his lunch. And as you could have guessed, this made her absolutely furious. She went to the school really upset, telling school administrators that they needed to stop paying for his lunch, saying that if she wanted him to have school lunch, she'd pay for it. A few days after the incident of Nicole coming to school angry, Gavin showed up to school with a chipped tooth. Obviously, this was very concerning. We can guess how this happened based on what we know about this case so far, but school staff thought that he probably just fell and broke his tooth that way. It happens. By the 2022-2023 school year, Gavin was in the fifth grade. At this point, a starving and malnourished Gavin started stealing lunches from the other kids. Staff started noticing that the boxed and bagged lunches were going missing, and eventually they realized that it was Gavin. At that point, staff and even other students would share their lunches with Gavin. Again, staff was not allowed to buy his lunch at this point, but it was clear that he was starving and he was desperate. So they did what they could, sharing their own food with him to make sure he at least got to eat something. Which, as a side note, the fact that the school administrators didn't raise the alarm when Nicole said that Gavin wasn't allowed to eat is so far beyond me. I used to work at a camp counselor over the summers, and I know that's a lot different than working at school, but the kids would be at camp all day, so they either needed to bring a lunch or pay for one to be provided. If I saw a kid that never got food, who I then started providing lunch for just for their parents to say that they weren't allowed to eat for the eight hours that they were at camp, I would immediately report it. There is no reason why a kid should be denied food while they're at school or some event that is taking place all day. Obviously, there are religious and cultural exceptions, but those are usually temporary and are for certain periods of time. There is no reason why kids should go multiple school years being denied food every single day. Over the course of several months during that 2022-2023 school year, multiple staff members in that cafeteria tried helping. At first, when they called the Department of Child and Family Services to report their concerns, they were told that the principal needed to make the report. 
So they reported their concerns to the principal who said they'd take care of it. After that though, it didn't seem like anything was being done. So staff called DCFS directly multiple more times to report. The cafeteria worker I mentioned earlier, Jan said that at first she didn't know what exactly to make of Gavin's situation. Was he a kid with an eating disorder and that's why he was eating out of the trash? Or was he starving? She also wondered why he missed so much school. Was he really just sick all the time or were his parents keeping him home? She felt that school was a safe haven for Gavin, so when he missed, she was really concerned. She wondered why school administrators weren't following up more with these absences, seeing how frequent they were. But as I said, over time, the more she got to know Gavin, she was really concerned that he truly was being starved and she knew he was suffering. But despite her best efforts, nothing was being done about it. In fact, she was prevented from helping. By August of 2023, Nicole ended up pulling Gavin out of school completely to homeschool him. This was just such a tragedy for Gavin, who loved school and felt safe there. At school, he had other people watching him. In my opinion, none of these people did even close to enough, but he at least had other adults keeping an eye on him. He got to eat food given to him by other students and staff. He was free from abuse while at school. He got time to socialize with other kids and learn all about the subjects he loved. But now, he was pulled out and spent all of his time at home. No escape from everything he was going through. After Gavin was pulled from school, no one saw him or heard anything about him for almost a year. There were no updates to his case. It didn't seem like anyone bothered to check on him after being pulled from school. None of the DCFS reports were followed up on. Even the staff at school, they all wondered what happened, but no one was giving them answers. Jan, the cafeteria worker, said that she really hoped that maybe he stopped attending that school because he was pulled from the home with Nicole and Shane. She was hopeful. She wasn't getting any answers and she wanted to know what happened, but she wasn't getting those answers, so she was just hoping for the best. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Nothing happened in this case until July 9th, 2024, when officers were called to the home of Nicole Scott and Shane Peterson with reports of an unresponsive child. According to first responders, when they arrived to the home, they found Gavin lying on the bathroom floor unconscious. They were told by Shane and Nicole that Gavin had been sick for several days. He was vomiting repeatedly and now was not breathing. He was then rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. He was pronounced dead at that hospital. Immediately upon examining 10-year-old Gavin, it was clear that he was extremely malnourished and underweight. According to examination by doctors, it appeared that he was malnourished to the point that his internal organs shut down completely. At this point, it's too early to know an exact cause of death, However, I think it's pretty clear what happened. This poor, sweet, 10-year-old little boy was starved to death. After finding Gavin's body, of course, an investigation into his death began. As you could imagine, they found that Gavin was being forced to live under horrific conditions. They found that he was locked in a room all by himself while being monitored on surveillance cameras. Upon looking into those cameras, investigators found footage of Gavin in his room curling up on the cold, hard floor without any blankets or bedding or anything. He also was not wearing any clothes, just a diaper which was soiled for long periods of time and was not being changed. He wasn't allowed to move, wasn't allowed to eat, wasn't allowed to use the restroom. When he was given food, he got the same thing that Miloni described earlier, a piece of bread covered in mustard because he didn't like mustard. He was only allowed to drink a third of a cup of water per day. They also uncovered various text messages between family members, which also proved the allegations of abuse and neglect. Of course, investigators also spoke with various people, all who knew Gavin, Nicole, and Shane. 
They spoke with Miloni, who opened up about all of the abuse she faced at the hands of her father and stepmother. She said that once she finally left the home and stayed with her mother, she was terrified of what would happen to Gavin. She said that while living there, she was experiencing the brunt of the abuse. They weren't treating Gavin nearly as harshly as they treated her. But once she left, she knew that they would turn their violence towards him. Now, up to this point, I haven't made too much mention of Miloni and Gavin's older brother, Tyler. He was an adult by this point, but still living with Gavin and the rest of the family. You'd think that maybe he would have a similar story to tell as Miloni, but that isn't the case at all. According to Miloni, when the two were younger, they were basically best friends. But after the abuse started, that all changed. Tyler was allowed to do pretty much whatever he wanted. He wasn't abused or deprived of food. In fact, he was encouraged to take part in the beatings. Shane and Nicole told Tyler that if he wanted, he could beat his sister and brother, and he sure did. Miloni said that she didn't know what was going through his head at the time, with her thinking that Shane and Nicole probably brainwashed him. But nonetheless, he fully took part in the abuse of his siblings. Investigators also spoke with co-workers of Shane. Now, Shane and Nicole had a child of their own who is about a year younger than Gavin, who isn't spoken of too much in reports, but I feel like we can probably assume that this child probably wasn't being abused. Co-workers of Shane's said that he had a photo of this child on his desk and was always talking about this child. Meanwhile, co-workers didn't even know of Gavin's existence. He never once mentioned him. He didn't talk about him at all, so it's like he didn't even exist. So to me, this shows that Shane and Nicole had some weird resentment towards the children that weren't biologically related to Nicole. As Miloni said, as she looked more and more like her mom, that is when the abuse started. Once she was gone, the abuse was turned to Gavin. And in my opinion, I think maybe they felt that Tyler was too old to abuse by that point. By the time Miloni was 13, that's when the abuse started and Tyler would have been like 16 at the time. So maybe they just thought that he was too old or maybe he didn't look enough like the mother. Maybe he was always super loyal to Shane. I don't know, but for whatever reason, they didn't bother with Tyler. So to me, it seems like Nicole was pissed that Shane had three other kids with another woman and wanted to make them suffer as much as possible because they were an extension of Melanie. That's just what I think at this point based on the limited information we have. Of course, investigators have spoken to school staff, Melanie, and everyone else who saw Gavin during the course of the abuse who were all concerned for literal years before this happened. It broke my heart to know that he died that way. I don't know how anyone could do that to anyone. With support from her brother, Melanie Peterson is speaking out for the first time, heartbroken over the death of her youngest child, 12-year-old Gavin Peterson. Gavin was under the legal custody of his father, Shane Peterson. He lived with Shane, stepmother Nicole Scott, and oldest brother, Tyler. The last time I saw him, I took a picture of him um, because he looked so skinny. Melanie was last allowed to see Gavin four years ago when Gavin's father and stepmother found out that she was taking pictures to show the Utah Division of Child and Family Services. Melanie says they blocked her from ever seeing Gavin again by making a false complaint that would end her visitation rights until a judgment was made, a process that dragged out due to COVID. But it's not that I didn't try. No one helped me. I never would imagine that Shane would let this happen, to starve him and let him die. After the discovery of Gavin's body, investigators had a pretty clear picture of the abuse he suffered. He was being abused and neglected over the course of two long, grueling years, if not longer. Finally, after suffering so, so very much, his body couldn't handle it. And as a result of his mistreatment, Gavin lost his life. So 46-year-old Shane Peterson, 50-year-old Nicole Scott, and 21-year-old Tyler Peterson were all charged with one count each of child abuse homicide, two counts of aggravated child abuse, and one count of child endangerment. 
Then, Nicole is facing an additional two counts of obstruction of justice and one count of drug possession. Tyler is also facing a charge of obstruction, which to me, again, just blows my mind that Nicole was also caught with drugs. She could have been caught with them earlier had DCFS followed up and maybe they would have taken it as seriously as they did with Melanie. I mean, the drugs were the reason they were with Nicole and Shane to begin with. So the fact that Nicole also had drugs just makes this whole situation that much worse. That Melanie was being kept from her kids for years, even after completing multiple, multiple steps to better herself and her parenting. Yet Nicole was actively abusing those children and also had drugs, which I guess in Utah is the worst thing you could possibly have, and she was still allowed to keep them. It's just absolutely shocking and devastating and doesn't make any, any, any sense. Of course, this is yet another case of a clear failure by the system. Family members and school staff are all furious at the lack of action from DCFS despite the numerous calls. The fact that Miloni herself was brave enough to report the abuse, yet was told that no one can be charged over a bad haircut is just insulting and it is such a slap in the face. This is yet another state, Utah, where whatever the system is doing is just not cutting it. They are lazy, incompetent, and do not care about the welfare of children, and that is made crystal clear in this case. They would rather keep a mother who smokes weed and, yes, was irresponsible, but took the steps to improve herself. They would rather keep her from her children than someone who is actively abusing and starving her children. After Gavin's horrifying and absolutely preventable death, lawmakers in the state of Utah have been demanding answers from DCFS. Two lawmakers from the state said that they will be questioning DCFS about the lack of response to the multiple reports filed with them. As we heard, school staff made numerous reports of the abuse before he was just removed from the school altogether. He was locked away for an entire year with no contact with the outside world, suffering alone in silence as his body shut down from starvation. Lawmakers say that they're asking things like, how many times was this truly reported? Was it multiple caseworkers who all dropped the ball? Or was it one person who failed to do anything? Was it a group of people who all collectively ignored a starving child? We truly don't know at this point. One state lawmaker, Chris Christine Watkins says that she's working on a bill that would enable social workers to get a warrant to ensure a child's well-being. She said, quote, DCFS wants the right to be able to get a warrant to be able to put eyes on a child. They don't have that right now. We don't have that anywhere in the law. There are rules in place that say parents have a right to raise their children in the way that they want and the state can only step in at certain times. With this, she also wants to include a clause that would automatically trigger a welfare check on a child after a certain number of red flags are raised or complaints are filed. She continued, quote, When DCFS have so many reports that people think a child is being abused or neglected or hungry that after so many of those reports, they have to act. We're not going to let them off the hook. She said that the bill is in very early stages, so obviously there's a lot to iron out, but she hopes that this kind of bill can bring positive change in the way child endangerment cases are handled. And I just sat there and just thought about what he must have endured. Sabrina Tracy says hearing about 12-year-old Gavin Peterson's story has been difficult to stomach. You know, just sitting in that little room in a diaper, being fed one piece of bread a day. I want DCSF to come out behind their curtain because up until this point, all they have essentially said is due to privacy regulations, we cannot comment. Tracy told me she saw the complexities of the system firsthand when concerns over possible neglect came up in her extended family. So they started keeping the kids in the house all the time. They took them out of school. In Tracy's experience, it took relentless calling and reporting for months on end before the boys were removed from the home in question, something she wishes Gavin had. I want to know what reports were were made is that information even you on us like this committee in our legislature that you still don't know yes we um we are not allowed to hear that representative christine watkins chairs the child welfare oversight panel in the utah legislature i think we're just at that at that point where we know we need to change 
some laws or create new laws. Right now, Watkins is working on a bill that would allow social workers to get warrants if a child's safety is in serious question. And given the fact Gavin died and there may be other kids in tough spots, I asked if anything can be done sooner. Well, I think if they uh, call DCFS, they also have uh, the right to call police uh, and they can work together. An answer that points to a system Tracy knows to be broken. I don't know why they take the amount of time they do or where that disconnect is in getting that warrant to get them out and get them safe. Obviously, this is a tragic case that was mishandled so, so severely. Yet another case where many social workers have ignored or failed to follow up on ongoing reports of abuse. It's so frustrating, so disheartening, and just heartbreaking for little Gavin, who suffered so much for so long. However, I will say that it is refreshing to see a lawmaker who is out there and trying to make change, trying to actually do something about this, rather than just letting DCFS slip it under the rug. I genuinely hope that change happens, and I genuinely hope that DCFS takes accountability for this, but I'm so jaded at this point, I don't feel like that's going to happen, but I guess we'll see. As for Shane, Nicole, and Tyler, they recently had their first court appearance for their charges, where all three were held without bail. I think they cut them off from our family. Jared Doman is 12-year-old Gavin Peterson's uncle. He says Gavin's dad, Shane Peterson, and stepmom, Nicole Scott, kept Gavin and his siblings away from extended family for years. I think they started cutting them off from the rest of the world as well. Jared's family is devastated by Gavin's death. When I learned about it, I felt sick to my stomach. That you could allow your child to reach that point of starvation, that their organs are going to shut down. Shane, Nicole, and Gavin's oldest brother, Tyler Peterson, are charged with his death. I do feel a lot of anger over that. I don't know if I have words for Nicole. But when it comes to Tyler, the emotions are complex. As Melanie Peterson, Gavin and Tyler's mom, explains. I will always love all my kids. I love Tyler. Melanie says Tyler is autistic. She thinks he was manipulated by Nicole and Shane. And I do feel like he was a victim, and he's got his own story. KSL legal analyst Greg Scordis says a competency evaluation will determine if Tyler can stand in trial and could be a mitigating factor with the judge and prosecution. And whether or not he holds the same level of responsibility as a normal adult. As of right now, that is where the case sits as we await to hear back about their pleas and if there will be a trial. I just hope that they all suffer behind bars and get the worst possible treatment while there because that is what they deserve. They're all just complete monsters who looked in the face of an innocent, adorable, kind little boy and continued to abuse and neglect him for years. Cases like this will never fail to amaze me. The fact that Nicole had so much hate in her heart for these children, yet instead of just giving them back to her mother so she didn't have to deal with them, she kept them so that she could abuse them. She wanted them to suffer. She wanted to watch them in pain, and so did Shane. I'm also confused by what these parents think is going to happen in these cases. Like, you think starving a child for years isn't going to cause their death. These people always act surprised when the child dies from the abuse. Like, what did you expect? Clearly, these people are idiots and savages to begin with since they can inflict such abuse on a child, but still, it will just never make any sense. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video. This was such a heartbreaking one, and I know we've been covering a lot of these types of cases recently, but these truly are the cases that we need to be sharing the most. We need to see change in these systems. We need to hold the systems accountable for how they treat children. And most of all, we need to remember the names and faces of those children who lost their lives far far too early. After hearing all of the details, I really want to hear your thoughts. Why do you think DCFS failed to follow up on both Gavin and his sister's reports? Why do you think Nicole did this and why do you think Shane allowed it to happen? What do you think of the state preventing Melanie from seeing her children? And what do you think can be done in the future to prevent this from happening to another child? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. 
If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.